Well, if you have a Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Gladie, it's great to have you with us in church today. <laughs> How many teachers are here? Wow. Okay, the, 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 you wonder why teachers scratch their heads sometimes? The, these are quotes from kids. It, it comes from their schoolwork. Water is composed of two gins, oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is pure gin. Hydrogen is gin and water. <laughs> dew, dew is formed on leaves when the sun shines down on them and makes them perspire. The pistil of a flower is its only protection against insects. <laughs> Rhubarb, a kind of celery gone bloodshot. <laughs> H2O is hot water, CO2 is cold water. <laughs> Germinate, to become a naturalized German citizen. To keep milk from turning sour, keep it in the cow. <laughs> Vacuum, a large empty space where the Pope lives. <laughs> Momentum, what you give a person when they are going away. Okay, I've got one more here, if I can find it. A recent study has found that women who carry a few extra pounds, or a few extra, a little extra weight, live longer than men who mention it. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Do I ever get in trouble? Yeah, I've been in the doghouse a time or two because my wife will watch it on YouTube. Right here, oh yeah, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah chapter six. We're still on the topic uh, of learning to host God's presence. And, and I, I told you when I began this series that this would either be a very exciting series for you and you'll get into it, or you're going to get tired of me talking about it. And uh, I, I hope it's the former and not the latter. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for you. We thank you that we get to know you. That we get to carry you. That we get to have a relationship with you. That you live inside of us. That you've come upon us in the Holy Spirit. That we have the dunamis, the, the, the supernatural ability of God that you've entrusted, that we are a steward of. Lord, help us to be a steward of what you've entrusted to us. Help us to be a steward in such a way that it increases and grows in our lives. In Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, it says, In the, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Holy Spirit, come. You know, that phrase has the ability to confuse and, and to confound because it, it raises the question, how can God come to where he already lives? How can he come in a greater measure and yet countless revivals, countless encounters and moves of God have been birthed simply by the invitation for the Holy Spirit to come and to move in power. Now the, the key to understanding this is not to get caught up in the semantics. Don't try to figure it out with your mind. Don't try to wrap your mind around it. Recognize the varying degrees and measures of God's presence. This is illustrated in the passage that, that I just read. The amazing truth is that God's, God manifests his presence, that, that he shows up, but there's, there's more to come. 
You know, I, I, I feel like, you know, have you ever tried to explain something to somebody that you really didn't have the words to explain? Do you ever try to explain the Trinity to somebody? Or, or you know, certain things, certain concepts that, that you know, I mean, there's ways you can illustrate it. You can say, well, the Trinity is like H2O. <laughs> H2O, not the gen part. H2O can be in three forms. It can be in the form of water. It can be in the form of ice. It can be in the form of steam. Yeah, liquid, solid, steam, right. And yet it's the same substance. We say that God is one God, but he's manifest in three personalities or three forms, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but they are the same substance. So we can take something like that to, to try to help us wrap our mind around it. We could say that, I, you know, I am a, uh, I am a son, I am a husband, and I am a father, and a grandfather, and a great-grandfather. Great so, you know, we carry lots of different roles, and, and, and you know, we, we, we use those analogies to try to explain it, but what we're saying is that when God comes, there's still more of him to come. <laughs> When he shows up, there is, there's simply more because of who he is. And it's important for us to hunger and, and to invite the increase of his presence into our lives personally, but also corporately as a body. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The word filled there, the Hebrew word, actually implies that his robe both filled the temple and continued to fill it. He came, but he kept coming. The, the, the reality is, is that there is always more of him to experience. Now, in your notes, we've talked about this before, but I, I just want to talk about it again for a few minutes this morning. Levels of his presence. Do you know that, that no one can actually hide from God? How many tried for a few years? Yeah. We, we say that God is omnipresent. When God created everything, he did not withdraw himself from creation and, and hide that he is in creation. God inhabits everything and he actually holds all things together. He is before all things and in him all things consist. In Hebrews 1.3 it says he is upholding, upholding all things by the word of his power, by the power of his word. God is in creation. He is holding it all together. In him we live and move and have our being. He is not far from any of us. Paul told a certain community that were caught up in all the different gods and he said, you know, let me tell you about the real God. He's not far from any of us. And so the first level of his presence is that he is omnipresent. Now the second dimension of his presence is the new birth brings an indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we come to that place in our lives and when we realize that, you know, if I'm going to really find out what life is about, I'm going to have to connect with the creator of all things. I'm going to have to get connected with God if I'm going to really find my purpose, the reason why I exist. You know, have you ever thought about a, have you ever, <laughs> I was at a yard sale one time and I, I, I'm kind of like a guy and, and I like tools. And, and so, you know, I mean, it's like, wow, that is such a cool tool. And I bought this really cool tool, but I don't know what it does. <laughs> but it's so awesome. You know, and, and the truth is, I'm going to have to go ultimately to the manufacturer of that tool to discover why it was created. In fact, it would be good if I could find the manufacturer's manual. And see, we have to go to the manufacturer's manual to find out why we were created, the purpose, the reason for which we exist. See, apart from being connected with God, we just kind of go aimlessly through life, bouncing from fire to fire, from situation to situation. 
But it's not until we get connected with the creator that we realize, hey, I have a purpose. I have a reason for being. And see, when, when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and causes our spirit to be born again. And now, now though God is omnipresent, he actually personally lives inside of me. That's another, that's another dimension of his presence. Now, number three, the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings yet another dimension upon us. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Epi is the Greek word. It means to be clothed upon. At salvation, he comes in you. In the baptism, he comes upon you. He is in me for my sake, but he is upon me for yours. He is in us for us, for our blessing, a source of refreshing in life, but he is upon us so that we can minister to and bless others. And that's another dimension of his presence, of, of the Holy Spirit. In number four, it says that another dimension of his presence is when two or three are gathered together in his name. There, there are so many different dimensions of his presence. When, when two or three Christians gather together, they, there, there is yet another dimension of his presence that comes in our midst. He says in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. It, it's exciting. It's powerful. Now, Jesus, the context of that, in fact, we should look at that. Open your actual Bible, if you have one, to Matthew chapter 18. Imagine him asking you to open your Bible in church. What is church coming to? The context is not, well, we're, we're gathered together in his name, and Jesus is just going to kind of pleasantly hang out with us, passively being there. That's actually not the context. Let's read the context. Starts in verse 18. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now that's, that's not passive, is it? Again, I say to you, or, or he's saying, let me say this to you another way. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So what he's actually saying is that, that when we gather together in his name, he comes to answer prayer. He comes to release the kingdom. He comes to bind what we bind, to loose what we loose. That's not passive, is it? It's not just this kind of do you sense the, the peace of his presence? Now, I value that. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to belittle that at all because I love his presence and I could just hang out in his presence forever. But th there's, a, there's a sense of him coming in action, Amen. coming to be released into the earth. Now, number five, another dimension of his presence comes when we praise him. Isn't this amazing? When, when people come together, they're gathered together in his name, and when they begin to praise, whoa, I felt tethered there for a minute. When they begin to praise him and, and worship him and lift up their voices, he says he dwells in the praises of his people. His presence comes in yet another dimension to be released. But thou art holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. He actually comes and sets up his throne as king and begins to release the kingdom. Wow. Man, I, I was happy with just the omnipresence. The psalmist said, where can I go from your presence? If I go here, you're there. If I go there, you're here. I mean, you're there. If I go... And that, there's another one. Number six, another dimension of his presence was at Solomon's temple dedication. And I want to look at 1 Kings 8 for, at that for a minute. They were dedicating the temple. Now remember, the Ark of the Covenant had been in the, the tabernacle of David, which was just a tent. It was just a tent. I mean, it was an amazing tent because God was in it. But now, you know, and, and David had said, you know, I want to build you this house. I want to build you this amazing place. And God said, David, you've actually shed too much blood. 
I, I, I'm not going to let you do that. But your son can do it. And so David began to gather materials for his son. Silver and gold and, and all of these things. And Solomon built this amazing temple for God. And this is the, the, the day they're dedicating it. And, and they've offered all these sacrifices before the Lord beyond what they could even count, the Bible says. And then they, they brought the Ark of the Covenant and they set it in there. And they took out the poles because this was going to be a permanent place for God. And all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord, well, I'm sorry, let's read it. And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place that the, the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now that's what I want to see. That's church. The, 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 the God was with Israel a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. So this was not an unusual manifestation of his presence. And God still does this today. And so there was this cloud when they came out of the, the holy place and, and they, they were undone. They could not even get up and minister. Yeah. I remember being in a service. Do you remember this, Sarah? We were in a service in, in Lewiston and, and the, the presence of God was so strong that the speaker had fallen down. And so like it, it, it was like, and, and, I, and I thought, well, this is my chance to talk to her. It was, it was actually Ruth Rua Ball. If, you, if you've seen the Transformations video, it was actually her, her husband that was, uh, that was killed in, in that Transformations video that brought the unity of the churches together. And so there she is, and she's laying on the floor. And her, her testimony afterwards was, I never fall down. I, this never happens to me. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm going to, you know, it's like she's not talking, and, and I'm just going to go talk to her, but I could only crawl. Like, I'm way at the back. I'm way at the back of the church. So I, I just got under my knees and I just began to crawl. And I didn't feel weird at all because it was just one of those kinds of services. I mean, at least I was moving. So I, I, I just, you know, I, I crawled up on the platform and... And what? I, I, I don't know. I'll get, I'll get back to you, Rick. You know, and I, I got up there and I, I just went over to her and I, 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 I tried to talk to her, but my words were really weird. And I finally said, can I talk to you for a minute? And she said, okay. Now probably is a good time. <laughs> is it, but, but see, I love the idea of, of God's presence being so manifest that we can't do the stuff we normally do. The priests normally did certain types of things in ministry, but they were undone. They, they couldn't do it. Uh, they were undignified, and they didn't care. <laughs> ah. So these, these various pictures of his presence should tell us that God longs to increase his presence upon his people. He longs to release his presence into the earth. Revival history shows us what's available. The responsibility for the measure of God's presence that we carry lies with us. We always have what we earnestly want. Listen to me. We always have what we earnestly want. Bob Jones, a prophet of God who went to be with the Lord just a, a year or so ago, he made this statement one time. He said, everybody's got as much God as they want. But many times we just settle in a certain place. We just think, well, I guess this is, this is where it's at. I guess, you know, uh, that everybody's got as much as they've settled for. How much of God do you want in your life? How much of his presence? Bill Johnson says this, you can have as much of God's presence as you are willing to selfishly guard selfishly guard an excuse for selfishness but it's not really selfishness because the more you guard the more you can release to others even though we live with the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives there is more presence available for us to experience 
and, and to release. The more you encounter God, the more you become a God encounter for others. The measure that we experience in him is the measure that we can release to others. That's why you have to have a God encounter in order to become a God encounter for others. We have received the same Holy Spirit as Jesus Christ. The Spirit that we have received is not inferior, it's not a downgrade, graded Holy Spirit. It is the same Holy Spirit, the original Holy Spirit that Jesus received. Now some people believe that they, they just do not have access to what Jesus had. Because, I mean, he was Jesus. You know, and of course, you know, Jesus is forever unparalleled and unique in his role as Messiah, in his role as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. You know, he, 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 is, he is Lord. That's who he is. But he never intended to be unique in his earthly works. He never intended to be the only one who healed the sick. He never intended to be the only one who would perform miracles or the only one who would release people from their torment. He said, greater works than I do, you will do. I mean, it's really true. I wonder what some people do with that verse of scripture. Greater works than I do, you will do. There, there's a scripture I want to look at for just a minute this morning that it's one of those scriptures that I can't read without getting excited. Do, do you have passages or do you have places that you just like to read in your Bible? Because when you read it, it's like you, you, you may not understand it yet, but your spirit is kind of jumping. I mean, like you could run around the room. If we were one of those kind of churches. You're one of those kind of churches. You're one of those kind of Christians. It's Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now just think about that. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Wow. I mean, isn't that amazing? He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What an amazing scripture for healing. You know, there, there's so many promises for healing, but if none of those existed, if this was the only verse that talked about it, I'd say, whoa. He who raised Christ from the dead dwells in me. And with, with him, he will quicken, he will give life to my mortal body through his spirit who dwells in me. In fact, let's make that declaration. I, I think I've got it in a personal way in the next passage. Next slide, Diana. There it is. Let's just say this together. together. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to my mortal body through his spirit who dwells in me. Now, I, I, just, I just want to interrupt the message for this prepaid no, uh, could we just stand, I, the message isn't done, but could we just stand for a minute? I want you to declare this with authority. Just make this declaration. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to my mortal body through his spirit who dwells in me. Now, we're going we're gonna to say it one more time, okay? Just one more time. <laughs> he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to my mortal body through his spirit who dwells in me. <laughs> now see, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Okay, you can be seated. We'll see how this works. <laughs> the same spirit that Jesus walked empowered by, the same spirit that actually raised him from the dead, dwells in us. When we experience powerful encounters of his presence, it awakens us to what we possess. And it gives us a supernatural ability to release it to the world around us. That we must live with a cry for more. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I go to bed at night, and, and I, actually, I, I go to bed every night. <laughs> Sometimes I go to bed at night and, and I, 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 as I just turn my heart to the Lord, I, I just feel this cry for more. And, and it, it happened to me this morning. I, I woke up earlier than I needed to wake up. And, and, I, and I, 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 I kind of dozed in and out of that sleep state. But in my spirit, I'm just saying, God, we've got to have your kingdom. We've got to have more. I want to see everything that defies the kingdom of God bow its knee before the authority of the name of Jesus. I want to see everything that's contrary, everything that's out of whack get back in whack in the earth. See, when you are born again, when the spirit of God came in you, that there's something inside of you that, that cries for that. The Bible says creation is crying out for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is, is, is longing to see God's sons and daughters coming into completeness and really manifesting who God is. A few years after the day of Pentecost, now the day of Pentecost happened in Acts chapter 2. A few years after that, things are going fine. Uh, numbers are increasing. But Peter and John released a miracle on a crippled man that shook a city. And, and you know the story. There was a, a crippled man that, what's that? Beautiful. At the gate, beautiful. Now, when you, had, when you were crippled in that day, you actually had a special jacket that you wore that gave you the right to be a beggar. It was like your, your authority to beg. And, and people often positioned themselves at certain places, so he was positioned at the gate beautiful. And Peter and John were, were heading into the temple, and they see him, and he looked on them as if to receive something from them. And, and Peter said, you know, I don't have any money with me right now, but, but what I do have, let me give it to you. And he grabbed a hold of his hand, and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And, and he didn't say, now, now don't try too hard. I mean, I'd, I'd, no, he actually jerked him. How many know if God doesn't show up, this is not going to look good for the man of God? <laughs> So he jerked him to his feet. The guy landed on his feet, began to jump. And imagine, imagine the adrenaline running through that guy. I mean, he heads into the temple with, with those guys, and he's making a ruckus, and he's just so excited. Everybody's saying, what's going on? Aren't you the guy that, that's been sitting at the gate? And, I mean, it just impacts the whole city. And as a result, they were arrested. I think that's absolutely true. <laughs> and so they're interrogated. They're persecuted. They're, they're warned not to speak anymore in the name of this Jesus. And they said, you know, what do you think? Should we obey you or should we obey God? What would you do? And so they just warned them again, don't, don't do it anymore. And they, they released them. So they immediately head into a prayer meeting. And they say, Lord, help us to use more wisdom when we're talking about you so we don't get in trouble. No, that's not their prayer at all. Now, now Peter and John are known at this point for being bold men. It was, that was a bold act. Silver and gold, don't have it right now, but let me just help you. Bam! I mean, talk about a walking miracle. Talk about a, a, a testimony. Somebody that, that people would know. So they go to this meeting and they prayed for greater boldness. <laughs> yeah. 
You know, I heard somebody talk about this one time. They, they were saying that, you know, the enemy will go after you. But there's a certain thing they call the snake line on a mountain. And the higher you get up to that mountain, there comes a certain place where there aren't any more snakes. There's a certain level that you get to where the snakes can't, they're not up there. And so, here's their prayer. Let's look at this. Verse 29 of Acts 4. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And there came a fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We'll read about it in just a minute. You know, we always need more. Many Christians think that they are full of the Spirit because they speak in tongues. How many of you know you can be, you can, if, if, if you've spoken in tongues, you can speak in tongues when you're out of whack. In fact, I encourage you to speak in tongues when you're out of whack. But I'm saying that's not, that doesn't reveal where you're at. You know, I, I've used this illustration before, but how does God measure fullness? The, the manufacturer of this bottle, company, they, they, according to them, this is full. Right? No, let me just open this. Okay. That's full according to the manufacturer. Now, now it's full according to God's measure. In other words, you're not full until you're overflowing. You're not full until you cannot contain it anymore. See, we, we like to live with things in control. I'll drink to that. What is the evidence of fullness? Overflowing. Overflowing. So, so let, let's look at what just happened. Now remember, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, right? He got up and he preached the, the, the first gospel message. The people that responded were birthed into the early church. The early church was birthed. Now, now we see him in a, in a prayer meeting years later in Acts chapter 4, and he prays for more. He did not pray for relief from the persecution, but instead for more boldness. What is the matter with this guy? He prays to go deeper into the realms of darkness and rescue more people. And the Bible says, verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Did God answer their prayer? In Acts chapter 2, Peter is filled. In Acts chapter 4, Peter is refilled. Why? Because if we're doing this right, we need to be filled often. Because we're giving away everything that he gives us. We are living in a way to, to give it out. We are living to give. And, and in this, uh, God actually increases our capacity to contain him. Needing to be refilled is not a sign that, that something has gone wrong. Continual dependence on more is a good thing. Are you with me? Now we talked about how it's legal to desire more of God's presence and power. We want to be catalysts who experience his presence and actually become those that release that presence, release what we receive into other people's lives. Now in Acts 4, did the apostles need an upgraded Holy Spirit? Absolutely not. They received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. When they, but when they prayed for God to demonstrate his power through signs and wonders, the place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The result was they spoke the word of God with boldness. God answered their prayer by giving them a fresh encounter with his spirit. A fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, it's all available. It's all available. How much of God do you want? See, we very easily can settle into a certain place. 
But this is what I've discovered. And tell me if, if this has not been your experience too. If I settle into a certain place, I will actually lose ground yeah. without realizing it. But if I'm continually pushing, if I'm continually pressing for more, that's how I have to live. About my first pastor said it this way. He said, there's no status quo in God. Either I'm moving forward or I'm moving backward. Because if I think I can here, I will start going backward. I will start losing ground. Does that make sense? Since he already was filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, what happened here in Acts 4? They were experiencing a new dimension of what they had already been filled with. The Holy Spirit came in power and literally shook the building they were in. Power encounters are designed to equip us more completely. When I have an encounter, I need to be a steward of that encounter and, and let it... And, and actually be equipped by it. But the encounters that we experience with God affect the way we live. They experienced a fresh encounter. And what happened? They spoke the word with greater boldness. The first time they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. The second, the second time they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they spoke the word with boldness. Does that make sense? How many want more? You know, if nothing else is happening, I, I, I pray that, that it's stirring a desire for more of God. I, I really want to encourage you men that, that, are, that are thinking about the men's retreat, come with a desire for more of God. Come hungry to experience God in fresh and new ways. God is not a God of the same old, same old. God is a God of new things. The, the, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. There is just something new and fresh about God. And sometimes we allow our, 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 the, the things of God in our life, to, just to use a word, to become stale. You know, we, we, we've had certain experiences, we've, we've had certain things, we can talk about it, but it's not alive anymore. It's not... It's not generating something in our life. You know, we, sometimes we just need to return to our first love and remember why we got saved in the first place. Each encounter, each filling of the Holy Spirit is an invitation to know Him, to know Him more intimately. It's in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that his face is revealed. Oftentimes we think of power in association with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because power does come. But it's not just power. It's not just his hand. But it's his face. There's a scripture that I, I've read earlier in this series. I just want to read one more time and we're almost done this morning. It's found in Ezekiel 39, 29. And he says, I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. I just want you to think about that. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. When God poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost, that's when God began to pour out his spirit. Then he poured it out in Acts chapter 4. Then he continued to do it through church history and he's still doing it today. And he says, I'm not going to hide my face anymore because I'm going to pour out my spirit. What is he saying? He's saying in the outpouring of my spirit will come an opportunity for intimacy. In the outpouring of my spirit will come an invitation to intimately know me for a face-to-face -face relationship with the Lord. Let's stand together this morning. I want to invite the worship team to come up. And, and David, I, I actually think we should do as the deer. Is that okay? I'm, I don't have a problem with being undignified, but I, I just...
And, and, and as they're getting ready to, to lead us in that song, could, could we just pray together for a moment? Father, we thank you that uh, you're calling us into deeper places in our relationship with you. You're calling us to know you in a, in a, more, in a, in a deeper sense. And Father, we respond to that. We respond to the invitation of intimacy. We respond to know you face to face, oh God. And Lord, we know that as we experience you, that it positions us to release those same experiences into other people's lives, Lord. As we're learning to steward your presence, God. I just pray that you will just increase our hunger, increase our desire for you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. As the deer. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul thirsts after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. As the deer. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul after thee you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee you alone you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You're my friend, and You are my brother, even though You are a king. so much more than anything. You alone. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship Thee. I want You more than gold, more silver, only You can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee you alone are my strength you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Those last two lines. You alone are my heart's 
desire and I long to worship Thee. In this song, uh, the Lord gave me a prophetic picture of His love for His people. And in this picture, we're uh, a group of deer, young and old, coming down a very steep bank uh, to the river to drink on a, on a hot day. We could relate to it today. It was very hot. The sun was bright, and the deer were thirsty. And I was, I was look, looking at that picture, and I, and I said, Lord, what do you want to say to your beloved people here this morning? And he said, he said, I want my people to thirst for my presence, just as the worship team is saying. But I want my people to know that it's not without cause, because just as the deer come out of their hiding places, out of the, away from their protection, away from the shade, away from their places of comfort, as they get up out of those places, they can have their thirst satisfied. They have to make themselves vulnerable to the enemy. They have to be willing to be visible to the enemy. But in that, the presence of God meets us. And we can drink deeply as he desires us to so that we can walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, overflowing as Pastor Dave illustrated, as we taste and see that the Lord is good. The blessings are not only for us, but he comes upon us for the world. Wow. Amen. Well, good thing, good thing. And uh, while we were wor worshiping too, Lynette came up to me and just had a word of knowledge for you, Jeff that because of your heart as you walk through all of all of the things that you walk through that that God has touched your kidneys and God has touched your liver if you've ever had any problems with there those it's done it's over they're totally healed totally healed in Jesus name I would like us to just sing one more song that that Lord I need you I come, Lord, I come, I confess, I confess, bowing in, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart.
Thank you, Lord. Can we just close our eyes and just bow our heads before the Lord? Father, we thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives. Thank you that you're drawing us into a place of intimacy with you, Lord. It's the very cry of our heart, Lord, to know you. It's the very cry of our heart, God. Nothing can satisfy us in this world. Only our relationship with you. If you're here this morning and, and, and you don't know Jesus, you haven't come into a relationship with him yet, I, I just want to give you an opportunity. I, if you're here and, and, and you'd like to say, Jesus, I, I need to know you. I need to know why you created me. I need to know my purpose in life. I want to find that out. Would you just acknowledge that by raising your hand this morning and say, yep, that's me. I want that. I need that. Just pray this with me. Father, I want to know you. I need to know you. You are my God. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. Let me know your righteousness. Show me how to live for you. Show me why you created me, Lord. Give purpose to my life. I will serve you with all of my heart. I will walk in your ways. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite the prayer teams to come up and just be available to pray with people this morning. If you need healing, if you need just a furthering of the things that God's been stirring in your spirit, <laughs> and don't forget it. Just a reminder, we are having a water baptism. Next Sunday is going to be a great time. And a potluck afterwards. The benediction is out of Jude chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and dominion forever both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you saints. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.